is risen indeed. The risen Christ is with us. Amen? Amen? What a joy it is to be with you as we worship God together today. I want to extend a special welcome to any guest who is with us today. If you are a guest, we hope you'll fill out one of the connect cards and the attendance pad as it gets passed down the road, but we're particularly glad you're here. We've got a gift for you on your way out the door. Um, even more exciting is today we have our Eagle Lake counselors with us today for the beginning of Eagle Lake. Let's welcome them. So I'm going to invite them to go ahead and start lining up along that front row there. 
Um, and I'm going to have them come and introduce themselves. We've got over 100 kids coming into the church building uh, this week. And uh, they're going to be learning about God, learning about the powerful work of Jesus. And uh, I'm so thankful for um, them coming to be with us. It's going to be a really fun week. I know my kids have been looking forward to it since last year. Um, and so, so it's just going to be a really fun time. I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves and uh, say their name, where they're from, and then also the theme this week is kind of a circus theme. And so I've asked them, as I did the first service, to tell you their favorite act at the circus. All right, so here's a microphone. Okay. My name is Ryan Putnam. I'm the program manager of this week of camp with all these wonderful counselors and leadership members. I am from Victor, New York, originally, now living with Colorado Springs, now living in Colorado Springs, wow. And my favorite circus act is going to have to be the trapeze. My name's Alaren. I'm Ryan's wife and the assistant program manager of this wonderful team. Um, I'm from Williamsport, Pennsylvania, but now also live in Colorado Springs. And my favorite circus act would be the mimes. My name is Abigail. I'm from Denver, Colorado, and my favorite circus act is probably also the trapeze. My name is Grace, and I'm from Tacoma, Washington, and my favorite circus act is the tightrope. Uh, my name is Hannah. I'm from Sarasota, Florida, and my favorite act is the juggler. My name is Haley. I'm from Colorado Springs, Colorado, and my favorite circus act is probably also the trapeze. I'm Jabari. I'm from Lakewood, Illinois, and my favorite uh, circus act is probably the guy that gets shot out of the cannon. <laughs> I'm Ben. I'm from Golden, Colorado, and my favorite circus act would probably be the strongman. I'm Silas. I'm from Carver, Minnesota, and my favorite circus act is probably the lion tamer. Hi, I'm Clara. I'm from Denver, Colorado, um, and I'd say my favorite circus act is the aerial silks. Um, I'm Riley. I'm from Memphis, Tennessee, and my favorite is probably jumping through fire. I'm Katie. I'm from Okeen, Oklahoma. Um, my favorite circus act would be anything to do with the animals. Hi, my name is Julia. I'm from Warner Robins, Georgia, and I like the acrobatics. Hello, my name is Holden. I'm from Orlando, Florida, and I like the lion tamer as my favorite circus act. I'm Sammy. I'm from Colorado Springs, Colorado, and my favorite is anything to do with fire. My name is Ron, and my favorite act is the elephants. Yeah, thank you all. Let's welcome our Eagle Lake counselors. We're going to say a quick prayer for them. Let's pray. Most holy God, I'm grateful for the chance um, to welcome so many kids into this church to tell them about the love of God. And um, I'm thankful for all of these counselors who've devoted their summer to sharing that um, good news with them. We pray that it might be a week of fun and merriment and joy and, um, and above all, that we may give praise to you. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. You all can sit down or you can stay up there and sing if you want. But um, let's stand together as we give praise to God. I need you to soften my heart and break me apart. I need you to open my eyes to see.
If you're able, please remain standing for our scripture lesson today, which comes from the book of Genesis. And let me find it. Chapter 25, verses 19 through 34. These are the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel of the Aramean, Padam Aram, sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer, and his wife Rebekah conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is to be this way, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two people born of you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The elder shall serve the younger. When her time to give birth was at hand, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy mantle, so they named him Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand gripping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man living in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field and he was famished. And Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stuff, for I am famished. Therefore he was called Edom. Jacob said, first sell me your birthright. Esau said, I am about to die of what to use to me is a birthright. Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's sing together.
Come Holy Ghost, our hearts inspire and fill us with your celestial fire. For if you are with us, then nothing else matters. If you are not with us, then nothing else matters. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So sometimes you can get lost um, and miss the forest for the trees. Um, so today I'm going to start off with uh, focusing on the forest a little bit. The Bible is an interesting thing, I think. Um, there's nothing really like it. The Bible, you know, it's an anthology of different books written at different times by different people with different understandings of how God works in the world. There are multiple genres of literature in the Bible, right? History, there's laws, there's even accounting, there's poetry and wisdom, prophecies, letters, apocalypticism. But as a whole, I like to think of the Bible as one big story of God, right? The story of God creating and humans failing, of God doing the long and beautiful work of redeeming broken relationships by choosing and working through the people of Israel. It's the story of a God who gave himself to us in the person of Jesus, who died our death, who rose from the grave to offer us life. And it's the story of the church, opened up to all people all over the world who seek to participate in God's redemptive work through Jesus by the Holy Spirit. So, that's a weird way to start a sermon about Jacob and Esau, right? But I say all of this because I don't want you to hear, I don't want you to hear these stories from Genesis that we've been journeying through and see them as some standalone moral tale, right? As though the stories contained within the Bible are Aesop's fables, right? What's the moral of this story, preacher? Um, but the Bible is not the tortoise and the hare or the goose that laid the golden egg, right? These stories are a part of a bigger story of salvation. And my job, at least I think, I think my job, is to help you see the bigger story. So there's not a lot of human characters in the story, uh, in the book of Genesis, that you should emulate, right? It's not like bad guy versus bad, good guy, like good guy versus bad guy. It's not be more or less like Abraham or be more or less like Isaac or Esau or Jacob. These characters are really important to the faith, right? But they are not moral exemplars, right? They are human. They are a mixed bag of saints and sinners. And I want you to not be more like them, but to encourage you to seek after the transformative and redemptive heart of God. So today we're continuing our sermon series that we've been journeying through for a while, Father Abraham and his many sons, and we hear today the story of Jacob and Esau, twin brothers who were anything but identical, right? These are unidentical twins. They could not be more different. From the time they are conceived, their life is marked with strife and rivalry and envy. It's a family trait. So when I meet with couples who are about to get married and I'm doing premarital counseling, I often have them make a genogram. Um, and a genogram is a glorified family tree. And rather than it just having names and dates on it, um, it also includes things like divorces and jobs and major life events and maybe some financial information and psychological information. And when we get together, we look at this genogram, and then we chat, and what we look for is recurring patterns. So, right, history may not repeat itself, but it'll rhyme, right? And so we're looking for the way that these patterns recur in their life. So does one side of the family have a history of divorce or infidelity? Is there one side of the family that tends to be blue collar and another side of the family that tends to be white collar? Plumbers or teachers? Business-minded aunts or agricultural uncles? Urban or rural lifestyles? Are there psychological patterns? Depression, anxiety? Are there gender role expectations for people in their marriages? How about the type of people that they marry? Who do they marry and why do they marry them, right? Um, do they marry for money? Do they marry 
passive people or people with a certain personality? Do they create big families or small families? I often ask, who in your family are you most like? Not who do you like the most, <laughs> but who are you most like? Who do you resemble the most? And how does that change the way you think about your marriage that you're about to enter into? How does that change your future? It's not that the patterns are prescriptive. It doesn't mean that like just because this has happened often means that it's going to happen in your life, but it does make you stop and think about the larger picture, I think. So as I read this week's scripture, I began thinking about, because I'm a nerd, Abraham's genogram. There are certainly patterns in this family tree, right? Abraham and Sarah were unable to have children until God intervened. In this week's scripture, we find that Isaac and Rebekah were also unable to have children until God intervened. And then in the coming weeks, we'll read about Jacob and Rachel, that they had that difficulty too, right? We'll also read about this long line of family dysfunction. Abraham and Sarah certainly didn't have it all together. They trusted God sometimes, but there were plenty of moments that they didn't. Right? Think of Hagar and Ishmael when Abraham and Sarah took things into their own hands. In the coming weeks, we'll hear about Jacob and Rachel and Leah and talk about marriage dysfunction. You just wait for that story. Um, woo! Uh, there's also this strange pattern in the way that men treat their wives. Not often so good, right? Abraham, twice, not once but twice, passed off his wife as his sister to save his own life. And then wouldn't you know it, Isaac ended up doing the same thing, passing off his wife as his sister. Patterns repeat themselves. In today's scripture, we discover that the family dysfunction starts pretty early. In fact, um, for Jacob and Esau, the family dysfunction starts in utero. Jacob and Esau are wrestling and they're fighting within Rebekah's womb. So most women who are pregnant, they deal with things like heartburn and morning sickness and like a kick to the side can be really painful. And of course, you know, those struggles can be much worse, especially with twins. But rarely do you hear a woman say, these children are fighting in my womb. If this is the way it's going to be, I'd rather be dead. But that's what Rebecca says. If it's going to be this way, why do I live? And then she goes on to God, she goes to God and she's in lament and she's in prayer and God responds by saying that the children in her womb are actually a living metaphor. Two nations are in your womb and two people born of you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, the elder shall serve the younger. So not only is she in a web of misery and suffering, now she discovers from God that the children in her womb are going to keep her that way. And even future generations are going to know this division. And it also points to another pattern in the genogram, right? God said the elder is going to serve the younger. Now, that ain't the way it's supposed to work in the ancient Near East, right? The eldest is supposed to be the one in charge. But the reversal of, the, of that social norm is something that we're going to continue to read about, right? Remember that Isaac was not Abraham's first son. Ishmael was. And Jacob will seek to marry Rachel before Leah, even though Leah is the oldest. Again, that's, that's a fun story. Um, and we'll read about Joseph, who was Jacob's favorite son. But Joseph wasn't the firstborn, or the second, or even the third. He was the eleventh kid. And all of this adds to the family dysfunction in the family, right? The next bit of the scripture we read today is the most gripping of images, pun intended. As the children were being born, the wrestling for dominance continues all the way through the birth canal. Esau was born first. And then came Jacob right behind him, grabbing Esau's heel. <laughs> it's a way of saying, like, 
they're fighting all the way through for who's going to be first. It's Jacob's way of saying, I'm supposed to be born first. I'm supposed to be the eldest. I'm supposed to have the birthright. I'm supposed to have the blessing. I'm supposed to have the property and the influence and the money. The future of our family is supposed to belong to me. And they name him Jacob, which means heel in Hebrew. The account in the scripture really lampoons the firstborn in this one, right? So the scripture says that Esau was born in Reynolds County. Um, that doesn't actually say that. Um, he's a rugged outdoorsman, right? He works in the fields. He's more of an outdoor hunter kind of guy. And the scripture said he came out all his he came out red, all his body like a hairy blanket. So they named him Esau. Esau is the Hebrew word for hairy. And mentioning that he was red is also noteworthy too because the Hebrew uh, word for red is a play on words that sounds very similar to the word Edom or Edomite, right? A reminder of God's word, right? That there are going to be two nations in your womb and the older and the younger shall serve the older, right? Israel, Jacob will become Israel, Edom, Edom will serve Israel. And his unidentical twin, Jacob, is presented as some shrewd, erudite mama's boy. He was quiet and lived in tents, which I assume means that he hated to do manual labor. Um, again, these two could not be any more different. Their differences create all of this family dysfunction. And it didn't help that their parents pick, picked favorites, right? So Rebecca is team Jacob all the way. And Isaac, well, he was fond of Esau. That is a recipe for disaster. Speaking of recipes, <laughs> Jacob had a recipe for a pot of stew. <laughs> you may know the story, right? Esau is the, short, the short-sighted, dim-witted brother comes out from the fields and he says, let me have some of that red stuff there. He didn't even call it stew. In the, in the NRSV they translated, let me have some of that red stuff, which is probably again a play on words. Remember Edom and red in Hebrew. Give me some red stuff. I'm starving here, right? So Jacob likes to work smarter, not harder. And he says, sell me your birthright. Sell me your birthright and I'll give you some stew. And Esau says, well, if I don't get some of that stew, I'm going to die. And what good is a birthright if you're dead? Now, Esau had probably had breakfast like two hours before, right? But Jacob gives him the stew and Esau despised his birthright. This takes brothers picking on each other to a whole other level. It's interesting, isn't it? How there can be so much turmoil and so much friction with the people that you're supposed to be closest to. People you should love the most sometimes become the ones you loathe the most. You can see it on social media, right? The source of so many problems in our world. One person posts something on Facebook and then a friend or a family member gets their feelings hurt and then they start debating politics and then they start blasting one another and they're unfriending one another families am I right why is that we can all see that in our culture today right even in my beloved United Methodist Church there are people that profess they're committed to their church and they say their church is a family it's their family and yet they fight and they split from one another the people, they said that they were a family. These are supposed to be the people you're closest to. And now because you don't agree on something, you decide you can't worship together. We're family, and yet so often we feel so ill-equipped to get along with one another. I read this story, and I, I realize, as I do, everybody in this story is messed up, right? It's all over their genogram. They are dysfunctional, they are melodramatic, they're crafty, tricksters, they love God, but they are so messy. 
Rebecca and Isaac, they pick favorite kids. Jacob deceitfully takes advantage of his brother. He's wily and sly. Esau, short-sighted, impulsive. He's not the brightest crayon in the box. Nobody does anything right in this story. Nobody does anything virtuous in this story. Remember, this is not Aesop's fables. There's no moral tale here. There's just people who are supposed to love each other, people who are supposed to look out for one another, not loving one another, and not looking out for one another. People who should, you should be standing up for, you're stabbing them in the back. Families being anything but familial. It's just this messy, dysfunctional family in this messy, messy world. So Jesus prayed after he had celebrated the Last Supper. He prayed that we might all be one. That we might all be one together. It wasn't a command. It was a prayer. It's a prayer that still is day just seems like such a, a distant idea sometimes. So um, the Methodist had split just before the Civil War. Um, and the story goes something like this. It could be urban legend, I don't know. But the story goes something like this, that Lincoln said, if the Methodist can't stay together, what hope is there for the Union? That hits a little too close to home for me. Jesus prayed that we might be one. And the enabling of that oneness was to come the next day in crucifixion. And in the sending of the Spirit, he promised right before he prayed, Esau and Jacob are at odds for years. But at the end of the story, even these two reconcile. They reconcile at the end of the story. That's the work of God and the story of salvation. God playing the long game, you know. At last, we will be one. At the last, we will be one. And we should probably try to model that oneness now. I wonder if your life is messy. It ought to be. You should absolutely be around people who think differently than you. You should absolutely be around people who don't believe like you. You should absolutely worship with people who don't read the Bible the same way you do. I heard a preacher this week say um, that if you're only around people who are like you, then you are going to be arrogant and ignorant. Convinced of your own knowledge, you'll be like Narcissus looking in that pool, only seeing a reflection of yourself. That's a blunt way of saying it. That's what an echo chamber can do, isn't it? But we should know, we should know that the other way is hard. Sometimes you find yourself at odds with the people you love the most. But God is the God at work in the messy. Behind the scenes, when it seems that hope is gone, there's Jesus praying, redeeming. That's the story of salvation. I wonder if you've got an unidentical twin. People that you're supposed to love, and yet you've been fighting with them for years, grasping for power over the other, grabbing heels and selling soup. Maybe you're a mess. Sometimes I'm a mess. And maybe your genogram patterns are pretty obvious, not too flattering. But God, is there working in the background to bring salvation and one, oneness to all of us anyway. Thanks be to God. Amen. At this time, we're going to give of our tithes and our offerings. Um, and as the band comes forward, I want to remind you that there's three ways you can give here at the church today. You can give an offering plate as it's passed around. You can text your offering to 73256 and put in the message 
Memorial UMC, one word and the amount you want to give. Um, or you can go to our website, memorialumc.church, and then click on the Give tab. Let's stand together as we sing praises to God and give of our tithes and our offerings. gonna be afraid cause these waves are only waves I'm not gonna be
At this time, we're going to enter into a time of prayer, and uh, I encourage you, as I always do, to take a look at the prayer list that's sent out on our weekly update and see the names that are there. A lot of folks in, uh, who are part of this community of faith who uh, encourage you to hold in prayer. Um, let's go ahead and approach the throne of grace, shall we? Most holy and loving God, we give you thanks for your goodness and your grace. We give you thanks that as complicated, messy people as we may be, that you're at work in the background, redeeming, restoring, and resurrecting. We pray that you work in our lives afresh, that we may see your nurse mercy anew every morning. Help us to be those who love you with our heart, mind, soul, and strength and love our neighbor as ourself, who love you through acts of worship and devotion and love our neighbors through acts of justice and compassion. We pray for all of those in our hearts and minds this day. And we pray that we may be a church that is faithful to the call you've placed on our life. That for those who are in need, that we may show compassion sending cards, making visits, whatever it may be that you're leading us to do so that your love is known and the power of your resurrection is felt. Give us hope. Give us peace. And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name.
<laughs> what a joy it is to have uh, Bethany and Derek back with us today, and uh, it's a gift to have them back, yay. And of course, it's always fun to have uh, the drumming preacher back there, it's always nice. Speaking of the drumming pastor, why don't you give us some announcements, Pastor Chris? <laughs> sure. Uh, so a few, that's really loud. Um, a few announcements as we send you out. Uh, first, just a reminder, there's lots of things listed on the back of your bulletin. Take a look at those to see what's coming up. But to highlight a few, first we have our water park night at the Farmington Water Park. We've run out the whole thing August 2nd. It's a Wednesday from 6.30 to 8.30. Uh, splash pad and all. Concessions will be available for purchase. But you can bring anybody you want. Uh, there's no limit, so bring friends, family, kids. Uh, we'd love to have a full park that night. Then on August 27th, something to put on your calendar is that is our blessing of the backpacks in our promotion Sunday. So all three services will bless backpacks for uh, students and teachers alike. And then uh, in this service, we'll have our promotion Sunday where kids will officially move up, third graders will get their Bibles, and, and we do that. Uh, and then you may remember last summer, we set up a table of sharing down over by the sanctuary. Uh, so for those of you who have home gardens as you're harvesting, if you've got some extra and don't quite know where to put all that zucchini or tomatoes, uh, you can take them over there and then people who need some can take some as well. Uh, and then whatever's left over on Wednesdays, we bring down here and we give away to those who come to Mums to our free meal so that they can take that produce home. Thank you very much, Pastor Chris. Go forth from this place. Loving God with your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself. Go forward from this place with your messy genograms that you have, knowing that God is at work in the background, making all things new. In the name of the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and all of God's people said, Amen. Go in peace.